Team, what's going on? We got another pop quiz coming for you here today from Andy Richardson over at 29E6, a structural engineering firm based in South Carolina. If you're not following Andy, go check him out on LinkedIn. He has a lot of great resources and a lot of great insight about the industry. All right, without further ado, I tried as hard as possible to not look at this until I snipped it into today's problem so that I'm fresh. I'm seeing it for the first time. I'm treating it as a pop quiz just like all of you are. So let's see how we do. Use any available resources that you need to complete the problem. Document any resources used, and if you have any questions about the problem, well, screw you. Just do the best that you can. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is everyone might be screaming, well, that's such a vague question. Uh, it's not that it's vague. It's about, and speaking with Andy on this in an interview, it's, it's more not about getting that the answer is 15 or 24. Uh, it's more about having a conversation and uh, bringing up just what this question means to you and what things you would start to consider just based on the vagueness of it and, and how best you think you could answer it as an engineer. We know as engineers, we got two things, right? We got uh, demand on our structure and then we have the calculated capacity of our structure to resist that demand. Uh, he's, he's not saying demand or capacity. He's saying design shear. So that would be the only, hmm, up for debate. I am leaning towards the capacity side of things. I'm going to try to flex my engineering ability, um, to prove on the capacity side of things that I know how to derive the capacity of a shear wall or know how to ask proper questions um, to obtain information that I would need to do the calculations to find the capacity of a shear wall, if that makes sense. I know that I'm going to need to head to the SPIDWIS. I, I hate calling it that, the Special Design Provisions for Wind and Seismic. I'm going to use the 2021 edition, so that's the newest edition. I would check to make sure that uh, it is adopted into the state or local uh, building code. Uh, I don't think it's transferred. It's a very new uh, provision, uh, at least that edition, that 2021. So you'd want to make sure, has it been adopted? Has it not been adopted? Are you got to use a, a previous version, 2015, I think, was the previous one to that. Uh, so there's that aspect to it. I'm using the 2021. Let's get that down. To get capacities for shear walls, I think it's chapter four. Uh, chapter four, question mark. So we're, I know I need to go to those tables. And those tables will give you capacities depending on how you specify the construction of the shear wall. So there is no set capacity for a shear wall. And this is not true with just wood. It's true with any shear wall of any material type. Um, so how thick a wall is, you know, what it's constructed of, the material composition, fastening schedule, length of wall, height of walls, aspect ratios, openings in walls, solid walls, all of those kinds of things can uh, modify or, or do affect the strength of the wall. I think that right there would probably kind of cut the conversation if Andy was asking this. He'd say, all right, pretty much get what you're saying. I think you're on board here, but, but maybe not. Maybe he's like, I think you're, you're still doing smoke and mirrors. Show me a little bit more. Because uh, it did say resources, so I did say a resource, the SpidWiz, but let's let's go into it. So I did pull it up on the screen, so let's just, I'm going to do this as raw as possible. There's going to be some little edits to, to cut out my ums and some, some blank space in between there, but I'm not cheating in the background, okay? Okay, Andy, I promise, I promise. So he did ask for design shear, so we're not going to talk about hold downs. We're not gonna talk about, uh, I mean, I guess we could talk about uh, transfer down into your foundation, but I just want, here it is. The nominal unit shear capacity for sheathed wood framed shear walls, wood shear wall assembly types. And these are all tested assemblies. So they went through the boys in the lab and the women in the lab got cooking. They did a bunch of destructive testing and to see just uh, how much these these assemblies could take under a undeclared amount of load until they broke apart and ripped apart. And they studied these over and over and over again until they felt safe that they could dial it into a specific capacity 
for the assembly and publish it for engineers like myself, like you out there, to use repeatedly all across the country in many different building types. So, what do we got here? Well, I know that, yeah, oftentimes I use structural one rated uh, wood structural panels for something like residential construction that might be a little overdone. Um, you can see you have plywood siding, you have other options, you have just wood structural panel sheathing, but for commercial construction, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, it's often that we always specify structural one. It's just the highest grade sheathing material that you can get, and it's much more robust. And it just, if you're doing multi-story, you know, three, four stories of wood, people already get a little hesitant on that. But uh, when you're doing that type of construction, it's you want to be using the highest grade materials that you can get. Then we get into, well, the sheathing of your wood shear wall is the thing that is resisting your shear forces. Or it is also, can be said, I guess, is the material that is the load path to take that demand at the diaphragm down to the foundation. So the sheathing is the thing that does that. The studs of the wall, they, they yes, they fasten the fasten, they help fasten the fasteners to create the wall, but the studs are actually things that transfer gravity forces. So uh, we're gonna go 15, 30 seconds. You know, do I just soup it up? I mean, 15, 30 seconds, uh, you have your minimum nailing bearing length. So in the frame members or blocking. Um, so this is, uh, what do I wanna say here? Minimum nail bearing length in framing members or blocking. Uh, it's the, um, it is how thick your stud short face is that the plywood gets fastened to. Uh, so bang, we need inch and a half. So that's kind of a, a classic, you know, two by stud of any size that works out there. And then uh, you need your nail type and size. So length, diameter, all that kind of good stuff. 10D commons are, if I didn't scribble over it, are, get that out of there, are what we almost always specify out here again. Uh, so 10Ds, and those are three inch long nails so that gets you good penetration into your stud and of a certain size, it's just a, it's a good assembly. You have all of your materials and you have your fastener picked out, but now how frequently do you fasten the panel to uh, the studs? that impacts again, the capacity. And because at the end of the day, when you actually see one of these tested assemblies, it's, it's, it's interesting. You find out that the fasteners are the, the, the weak link in the chain, if you will. Um, and that is, at least to my understanding, that's almost by design. So the plywood is not the thing that's gonna be shearing apart under load. It's going to be the fasteners either shearing apart, deforming, popping out, coming loose in some way. Um, and that is the failure mode of your wall. And that is, again, from my understanding, what you want because 10D nails, you know, a nice long nail um, is made out of steel and that's actually a ductile material. So that can deform back and forth. There's many different failure modes of nails in single shear. They did a lot of testing on that. So they actually want to see when the shear wall is racking back and forth uh, that you're getting deformation in those steel fasteners. You're getting a little bit of slip, you're getting deformation and you're dissipating energy, creating a little bit more of a ductile system uh, overall, which is at least for, for uh, high seismic regions is, is a great thing. You always wanna get ductility when you can. So that's, that's how I was brought up anyway. That's how I was taught um, to understand it in that manner, but I could do more research if, if any of you out there are like, eh, that's not really how it's, it, I think it's happening or that it is happening. Let me know in the comments down below. Let me know. I, I want to know. Six is usually good. If you have a, a highly loaded shear wall, go to four. If you have a really high load, highly loaded shear wall, three, two, you need to be careful with three and two because that starts to trigger other requirements that need to happen because the nails are so tightly spaced together. Um, so got to keep an eye on that constructability in the field. You know, are the crews really doing two inches on center? You got to think about that in reality there. You can specify whatever you want, 
but you, it might, it might, there might, mistakes might be made or there might be some sloppy work sometimes. So I think when you get into this territory, you start to question maybe, well, instead of single-sided shear walls, do we go two-sided? That might be um, where you go with that. Because if you go sheathing on both sides of the shear wall, you can effectively double the capacity of your shear wall. So now if you needed three inches, you can get yourself double-sided back to six inches makes it a lot more manageable. But now you have this enclosed wall with plywood on both sides, so the trades might not like that so much. So you wanna make sure it's not in a wet wall or somewhere where there's a lot of conduit and electrical and all this kind of stuff having to go through the wall because someone might come along and, and rip a bunch of it out. So you gotta be careful there. Uh, but I, I know, I think we've, we've killed this one. Hey, subscriber. Ethiopian construction work professionals. What up, dog? Thanks for subscribing. That gets you V sub N. That's your in-plane shear capacity PLF of 950. Don't think that we're done there. Then you gotta always go down and read the footnotes for this big honking table. Wood is very, uh, footnotes are always critical. Don't skip these. For today, we'll assume everything's kind of hunky-dory, pretty standard. Doug Fur, you know, um, your uh, specific gravity is just 0 0.5. Things really aren't changed at all. And the only thing that we need to understand is how are we going to display our capacity? Are we going to do it in uh, ASD, allowable stress design, or are we going to present it in LRFD, load, load and resistance factored design? Depending on which one you choose, you modify this value in the table. So this V sub N will turn into either V sub N over omega for ASD or phi V sub N, if I can get to, the, that phi's supposed to, that line's, oh God. Hang on, let's try it again. Phi V sub N for LRFD. And uh, that kicks you over to the beginning of chapter four where it tells you what you need to do. And for this new version of this SpidWiz, it also depends if you are doing a seismic design or wind design. And you know what, let's just, uh, for seismic design of diaphragms and shear walls, ASD allowable shear capacity shall be determined by dividing the nominal shear capacity, V sub N, um, by 2.8. And for LRFD, shall be multiplied by 0 0.5. No further increases shall be permitted. For wind design, so they again, they break it out this time, go seismic wind. Um, da -da 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 -da. For ASD, you divide by two. For LRFD, you multiply by 0 0.8. That's it. I guess we, we really spent all of our time in the actual SpidWiz, um, not actually doing any physical calculations to get to get anywhere to answer our pop quiz question, but that's, that's sometimes the point. And that's the point of Andy's quizzes. It's not just, I don't want just the technical juggernaut in here ripping through telling me the answer is five. I, I want you to form a discussion um, with an open-ended esque question, because boy, I'll tell you, a lot of what engineers get for problems on their desk on a day-to-day -day basis is is open-ended. Uh, there are assumptions that need to be made. Engineers reduce those assumptions as much as they possibly can, asking questions to the architect, to the contractor, getting information from site, figuring out. Uh, you know, what are the exact parameters so that I can engineer it um, appropriately? But oftentimes in this world, uh, there are there are always a couple of unknowns uh, and you still have to come to a solution. You have to find a solution that, that best fits the problem. And everyone then agrees on it and you move forward from there. And you have confidence with your solution, even if there are some unknowns. You just make them known and everyone understands, and then you move forward from there. So, uh, Andy, I hope it was enough for all of you out there. Let me know which direction that you went. You might've even not gone capacity. You might've went demand side of things. And you were talking about live loads and dead loads and all this other hoo-ha, blah, blah. 
Why would you do dead, dead loads? Oh no, because you do dead loads and live loads if you're looking for, you know, shear walls and you need to do global stability and overturning. So what's the, what's the, you know, gravity loads on that wall? And then what's the lateral loads in combination of that wall? So you, you could go a whole different route. You could make a whole thesis out of a separate topic that I didn't even think about here. And that's the beauty of it. Hey, if you're still here and you're like, why am I here? And you're not subscribed, but you thought it was kind of cool. Uh, subscribe down below. Why not? It's totally free. You can unsubscribe at any time. It always helps drive the channel to more aspiring engineers or engineers in the world just trying to better themselves. If you have any other questions, let me know in the comments below and I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.